Hi there, guys. Nice to see you all again. Mr. Martin here. Thanks again so much for joining me. Today, we're going to be looking at a pretty key study in the world of psychology. There probably isn't a psychologist in the land who doesn't know these two psychologists or the meaning of their work. Loftus and Palmer, 1974. This is a major study into the phenomena of eyewitness testimony. If you're asked in your exam to write about a study within memory or a specific application of memory, this is the one to go about. Really, really good study, guys. So let's dive in and think. So let's define eyewitness testimony first of all. Eyewitness testimony is the idea that if you are there watching something happening, then you have a better memory of it. So eyewitness testimony for uh, multiple reasons is essential to the legal process. Think about this identification of suspects. Reliably, you want someone there to tell you that, yeah, no, I saw him. He was the one that committed that crime. Or if you're trying to get to the truth about a certain series of events, let's say a certain crime that happened, a shoplifting or, you know, someone that robbed a bank, you want someone there to say, yeah, that, that was the guy that did it. This, this is what's happening here. However, eyewitness testimony turns out isn't actually reliable. As it turns out, it's actually incredibly useless. A huge amount of eyewitness testimony is completely false. And the reason for this is that it can be distorted in very, very predictable ways. These kind of distortions can play a role when the witnesses are reporting a crime. So it's important that we get to the bottom of this. But it's not really until the start of cognitive psychology that researchers like Elizabeth Loftus and John Palmer begin to fully investigate the process that leads to memory distortion. So how are we going to test it? Well, they test it in this way. Very clever, very, very good little study here. So what we're really looking at here is to test something called the misinformation effect. This is the idea that if you watch something, can your memories of that event, that, that thing that's happened, can they be corrupted by information after the fact? So you've seen something, you've got a memory of it. Can that memory be changed? Loftus and Palmer were very interested in something called a leading question. This is a question that's phrased very, very precisely to get you to think about a specific thing. So this is what they're interested in way back in the 1970s. Now, they have realistically two experiments here. So the first one, very, very interesting. What they do is they get 45 undergraduate students together in a room and they let them watch a video of a car crash. Now, there's a number of different car crash videos here, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, at the end of the car crash, so they've seen these two cars hit each other, they are asked, how fast do you think the cars were going when they each other? And that gap there was filled in with a specific verb. Some of the verbs were kept very, very light. It'd be something like bumped. So how fast were the cars going when they bumped each other? Or it could be something like collided or hit or all the way up into smashed. So you can see here what's happening is that the verb is getting a little bit more angry each time. What Loftus and Palmer are thinking here was if we increase the anger inside that verb, the charge, of that verb, is the speed estimate going to increase? That's really what they're trying to prove here. Of course, being the good psychologists that they were, they kind of realized here that, okay, it could be the fact that these participants' memories have been changed, or it could just be the word that's leading them to increase the speed estimate. So how do we get around this problem? Well, they have a third group of participants they repeat the, the kind of the broad scheme of things. So they watch the car crash video. They're asked the question with the different verbs. But critically here, they're also asked a week later whether they saw any broken glass. Now Loftus and Palmer, it turns out, had rigged the experiment so that there was emphatically no broken glass whatsoever. The two cars smashed into each other, but there was no broken glass there. So what they're doing here is they're thinking, well, if we increase the charge of that verb, are the participants likely to change their memories and see something that definitely didn't happen? What did they find out? Turns out, experiment one comes off without a hitch. The more charge you put behind that verb, the angrier you make it, 
the higher the speed estimate. Now let's not beat around the bush here. This is a huge finding. For example, let's say you guys had witnessed someone knock someone over, a pedestrian over at a zebra crossing or something. And the policeman asks you, well, how fast was the car going when it contacted the person that they run down? You would give an estimate of, let's say, 30 point something miles an hour. Now that's fine. I mean, you're going within the speed limit, roughly within the speed limit. You're probably going to get off with a charge of dangerous driving, something like that. However, if the policeman asks you something like, how fast was the car going when it smashed into the guy and you say 41 miles per hour, then that guy that's driving the car is going to prison for dangerous driving, for manslaughter, for vehicular uh, murder, something like that. It doesn't matter how fast he was actually going. What matters is how you have misremembered what has actually happened there. Second part of the experiment, they find exactly the same thing. The more charge you give the verb, so if you're asked about collided or smashed, the more likely you are to report seeing the broken glass. Remember, there was no broken glass here. So it can be assumed that participants didn't remember the wording of the original question, that was a week later, but that their memory of the original event had actually been distorted. Really, really good study this one, just showing you that even changing one word in your sentence can completely change your memory of eyewitness testimony. Absolutely fascinating study this one. Just like every good study in psychology though guys, we have good and bad things to say about it. Good things, first of all, scientific. It's all done within the laboratory. We have a control of variables. It's reliable. There's a large number of participants actually, 45 in the first study and even more in the second. So really, really good, nice, robust research we're looking at here. Second thing is it has huge implications for the justice system. In a later video, we'll look at something called cognitive interview. Police, detectives, judges, lawyers, they all have to be so careful about how they word questions to make sure that their defendants or, or whoever it is are actually remembering things as accurately as possible. So a real nice study leaping into multiple areas of real world, um, real world events. Negatives, however, lack of diversity in the sample. All of these people are university students after all. Some of them might not have learned to drive yet, so maybe they just simply don't know what a car looks like when it's going 30 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour. As well as that reasonably small sample in the first one, so maybe we can put a question mark next to this. Another idea here is it's maybe a little bit artificial. You're sitting in a lab and you're watching a video of a car crash. Not that great, really. If you were actually outside and watching a car crash for real, would your memory be any different? There's actually a few different psychologists that say, well, yeah, it would. And especially if it's something very, very violent. For example, two psychologists, great psychologists called Ewell and Kutzel, have actually shown that your memory is incredibly accurate if you are witness to a violent crime, something like a bank robbery or a hold up with a weapon. So maybe we have a few things here we can say about the artificiality of Loftus and Palmer's study. Still very interesting, I think, and still very, very uh, good conclusions that they're reaching here. In terms of key concepts, guys, just remember about Loftus and Palmer that it's not just one study, it's actually two in one. We have the first one with the charged verb and the speed estimate, and the second one with the charged verb and the broken glass. If you can reliably tell me about Loftus and Palmer, what they did and what they ultimately concluded, then you know a lot more about your average person about eyewitness testimony or the lack of eyewitness testimony, as we maybe should say. Thanks a lot, guys. That's everything for this video. Cheers so much again for joining me, and I hope I can see you again at the next one. Cheers.